How much leverage should be used for any particular private equity investment? This question is at the heart of private equity. It is perhaps the second most important objective behind price discovery or valuation. And here's why. The exact same company acquired at a different price is not the same investment. And the exact same company acquired with a different capital structure is also not the same investment. Investment performance will be heavily influenced by these two variables, price and capital structure. And that's because the amount of debt raised to close a transaction changes the risk profile of the company. While debt can enhance returns, as we've demonstrated in previous segments, it also increases risk. So the decision to assume debt should follow a careful evaluation of the company's cash generation and potential to maintain appropriate levels of liquidity moving forward. To elaborate, debt is frequently secured by a lien on assets, which means that a company's decision to secure a loan comes with a legal obligation to pay interest and repay the principal or the amount of the loan on a schedule provided by the lender. As such, all eyes are on cash flow, frequently referred to as the lifeblood of a business, because ample cash flow permits the company to stay current on its obligations. If the company fails to make these payments, the bank can take legal action to recover the balance owed. The challenge for creditors comes when the collateral used to secure the loan is not sufficient to recover the balance owed. Seizing and liquidating assets is not attractive if it's done at a loss. This will compel some creditors to act swiftly when possible, which typically puts them at odds with the private equity firm. To protect themselves from the likelihood of this outcome, private equity firms can protect their equity with conservative underwriting standards. And just to break character for a moment, conservative underwriting standards is just a fancy way of saying by using less leverage. If what I've said up to this point has been confusing, please download the notes and read this language. These are very important concepts to grasp. And I thought this would be a good preface because we're about to get a little more technical. The answer to our question, what is the right amount of leverage, lies in the comparison of a company's ability to generate cash measured against the company's obligations. In other words, most debt ratio analysis involves comparing a measure of profitability against a company's obligations. Perhaps the most straightforward comparison is the debt to EBITDA ratio, which, as the name suggests, compares a company's debt balance to the company's annual EBITDA. This ratio is frequently included in lender term sheets and in the credit agreement. By way of example, in this senior lender term sheet, you will see both the total leverage ratio and the senior leverage ratio included under financial covenants. In the former, you would divide the total amount of debt by EBITDA, and in the latter, you would divide only senior debt by EBITDA. EBITDA is one of the most commonly cited measures of profitability used in financial analysis, but it is far from perfect as a proxy for cash flow. For this reason, additional ratios will be included that get a little more granular. To provide a more specific example, let's explore a very common ratio used by lenders to monitor loan performance. The fixed charge coverage ratio is used to measure a company's ability to cover its fixed charges, which can be defined largely as debt-related payments, but it can include additional obligations as well. Let's take a closer look at the fixed charge coverage ratio with this debt ratio analysis worksheet, which is attached to an LBO model. And we can zoom in to look at the formula where we have EBITDA less capital expenditures, less cash taxes over the sum of cash interest expense and scheduled debt amortization. Now, the logic behind subtracting capital expenditures instead of depreciation and amortization, the DA in EBITDA, is that capital expenditures are a cash outflow, whereas DNA, depreciation and amortization, are non-cash items. After that, cash taxes are subtracted to arrive at a better approximation of cash flow. Interest expense is not subtracted, but it can be found in the denominator because interest expense is one of the fixed charges. To elaborate on the denominator, this calculation looks at the actual cash required to remain in compliance in each period. Since you are more closely comparing the cash available for debt payments, to the debt payments required in each period, a lender typically requires that this ratio remain above a minimum threshold of 1.2 times to provide cushion in the event of deteriorated performance. 
This minimum threshold, along with other so-called covenants, will be included in the credit agreement, which outlines the remedies available to the lender. As a transaction moves towards a close, the investment team will be carefully evaluating all of these covenants against recent performance and each projected period. As part of this analysis, multiple capital structures will be compared against each other until the appropriate relationship between risk and reward is revealed. In the private equity training course titled Closing the Transaction, we will share schedules that can be linked to LBO models so that you can test multiple capital structures simultaneously. And this entire process will be elaborated on in greater detail. But for now, we've already covered quite a few technical concepts in this introduction. And in the next chapter, we will discuss two different approaches to private equity, the funded approach and the independent sponsor. All right, team, that's all for now. Thanks for watching.